Welcome to Pure Podcast. I'm Mike. And this is Orlando. And we're on episode 159. Yeah, we are on a level up review. And this one is super awesome because we're doing part two of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And man, this has been a really good book. I've been pretty excited about it. Um, I think overall, some of the principles are things that, you know, some people may have heard before. Um, I know I've heard and learned a lot of this stuff before, but he definitely articulates it in a way that's that's very powerful. And what I like about this is there's a lot of like motivational self-help books that give you a lot of like inspiration. And then there's like a lot of like really technical books that I, I'll read that like give you a lot of knowledge. And I think this book does a pretty good job of combining the two. There's like really practical, basic economics that could change your life if you put these principles into effect. But then it's also kind of motivational. It's kind of makes you like, it stirs up something inside of you that goes like, yeah, you know what? I, I, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to grow my assets. I want to actually become wealthy and not just simply work hard for money. I want to make money work hard for me. And so this is a good mix of motivation and knowledge. Agreed. And I think it's a perfect book for a reseller because you're already doing a lot of the stuff that's talking about in the book. So a lot of the items that Robert Kawasaki, I always mess up his name. Am I saying it right? I don't know. Robert, let me know. We'll have you on the podcast. Yeah, come on. We'd love to have you on. So he discusses a lot of things in here and I'm like, hey, yeah, this is stuff that resellers can easily implement. That's what I like about it, right? Because if you're already reselling, a lot of the concepts he's talking about, you're already aware of and you may not even notice it. But, you know, we're going to talk through chapter one. Are we going to chapters three through six? Yep. All right. So chapter three is very applicable because, you know, we call it side hustle. He kind of a little bit different. Now, it's only if you see you're reselling in the terms that he defines it. Yeah, it's got to be you've got to look at it as assets. And we talked going back kind of just a, a quick overview of last week. I think kind of the highlight was asset versus liability. Um, and then you have income and expenses, right? And so those are kind of the four categories in life. Income is money of coming in. Expenses is money going out. Liabilities are things that you own, but they actually trickle constantly into the expense category. Things like cars, uh, a mortgage, things like that are liabilities. Assets are things that you own that make you money. And so the takeaway from last week was increase assets. Wealthy people have more assets and fewer liabilities, whereas the middle class tend to buy liabilities. And then he kind of explained that the the like poor or lower class would buy um, just have expenses. And so kind of if you think about that, like which which box are you putting the most into? And a lot of times we focus on trying to increase our income, but not necessarily increase our asset column. And the asset column that is where your actual net worth is considered. Agreed. And reselling plays a part in that because I really do believe that reselling is one piece of it all. You know, like I, I think we all start, you know, as reselling as, as side hustles, right? And then we start seeing, hey, you can make some money off of this, right? And then you start accruing more money, right? And then you, depending, you know, where you are as far as your place of employment, you begin to maybe daydream. Like, could I do this full time? And then some of you are full time, and you've dabbled into other things, right? Where reselling is still maybe the main thing that you do, but you have other things that you're like, hey, maybe those will become income generating. And there's other resellers that we know that have moved past all of this and they've jumped into real estate or they, they're they just, you know, they ended up setting up different kinds of reselling businesses that run on their own. And they just, every once in a while, they check up and make sure everything's working well. I mean, there's so many different avenues. So let's delve into the first, well, not the first chapter, the third chapter. Yeah, so chapter three is mind your business. <laughs> That's exactly how he said it. Yeah, mind your business. And I love this chapter because essentially the idea is in life, we often have, and, and he kind of defines it as like, oh, what's what's your business? And, and, and an example he gives right off the bat is someone will say like, oh, I'm a banker. And his response is, oh, do you own the bank? No. Well, then that's your profession, right? Well, his McDonald's story is perfect. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, the McDonald's stories, I think, is one of the best in this whole thing. I think that's, wasn't that chapter six, though? Or No, it's right at the beginning. Is it? Okay. So, well, no, it, well, yes and no. He asked the question oh, to his right, audience. Right. like, hey, so what is the business of McDonald's? Right? And what do the people reply? Yeah, burgers. Right? And then he, <laughs> we're like going back and forth as if we're, and then he's like, well, if it's burgers, why don't you all make burgers? Because obviously, I mean, I, I love McDonald's, don't get me wrong, but their burgers aren't the best. Right? But then he makes the argument that Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, what, what, what was his final, like, 
Yeah, it's real estate, right? And yeah. if you ever watch that movie, the the McDonald's kind of, the, I think it was called The Founder. Uh, it, it did a really good job of kind of explaining how that ended up working out and how he realized and the person who kind of came in and kind of show him that the real estate was where his money was and not necessarily in the product that he was selling. Uh, but with the idea with the mind your business, going back to the idea of, okay, a banker, okay, that's your profession. That's how you make money. Like that's your income. But your business is again, looking back at that basic chart of income expenses. And then below that, you've got assets and liabilities. And no matter what your profession is, you should have your own business. And by business, he even at one point kind of says, look, I'm not saying you should start a business. He actually says, unless you really, really want to, he's not recommending starting a business because of, of the, just the, the, the total risk and how many of them fail. His thing though, is your business should be to accumulate assets, whether that's real estate, whether that's stocks, whether that's bonds, whether that's um, intellectual property, whatever it is to, to develop assets, because in the long run, that's going to be what makes you money. And so, um, yeah, so understanding what your real business is. And I, I think that's huge. Um, he says this, our current educational system focuses on preparing today's youth to get good jobs by developing scholastic skills. Their lives will revolve around their wages or as described earlier, their income column. And so he's kind of arguing against and multiple times in these sections. And this is, you got to understand we are two professional educators who are kind of, <laughs> at least I, I can't speak for Orlando. I mean, in a lot of ways, I agree with what he's saying that, that the education system, I think there's a lot of things that it does right, but I think there's a lot of things that's kind of archaic and it's really not preparing people for, like he would explain, um, financial literacy, right? Like actually understanding how money works and it kind of teaches people to have a skill go and then work for somebody else. And in this chapter, what I love so much about it is he's not, he doesn't push for people to actually leave whatever profession they're in. In fact, he says, work your day job, but use the money from your day job to mind your business, to, to think about and develop your own business, which may not be a business you actually run and start like reselling could be, but to develop assets and reselling. Like I think last uh, time we talked about it, I, I made the claim that inventory didn't necessarily go in the asset column. I actually researched it and there's a, a term for it and it is a, a type of asset as long as it sells within a certain amount of time. If it, huh. if it doesn't sell in a certain amount of time, like businesses like Target will count all of their inventory on their stocks as assets. Um, but after a certain, only if it sells within a certain amount of time, like legally is it considered an asset after that, then it's it turns into another category. So a lot of my stuff wouldn't count then. Right. Okay. But hey, so going full circle though, back to the McDonald's story, right? The argument is made that Ray Kroc understood real estate, right? And, and the in the end... You know, the, the author here says today, McDonald's is the largest single owner of real estate in the world, owning even more than the Catholic church. It's a lot of real estate, right? And that, you know, if you're talking about the Catholic church, Catholic church has been around for, you know, about 1500 or so years. So we're, we're talking about that. The fact that he's able, he was able to mind his business, right? He understood, right? And if you watch the founder, it's pretty interesting how it wasn't about the food that they made. It's the systems that he put in place, right? How to make the milkshake faster, how to make it taste better, how, how to make sure that, you know, even the way that servers were like moving around the counter and so on, or the cooks. And it, it's a very, it's the same thing. And, and I also wanted to discuss about the idea of education. So I, it depends on where you get educated, right? Because I will say overall, when we think of education, it, even I grew, I, even when I grew up, it was basically, you know, my dad and it, my dad wasn't the poor dad. I would say, if, if education could be a dad, it was the poor dad, right? It was saying, Hey, get your degree, go to college. Cause if you don't go to college, you're not going to amount to anything, right? You're not going to be able to, you know, get a good job. You're not going to be able to make good money. Now there is an argument to be made there, right? It all depends on the profession. All depends on what you're looking to do. But what's missed is, is that, you know, the high school diploma has become the entry point, like for any job. Right. And so it's like you can't really get a job anywhere, but that's changing now because I think people are recognizing that you could be good at a lot of things and not have finished high school. Now, it's rare. It's rare. But this is why it's because I really believe, you know, depending where you went to school. Right. Some schools are great at giving you lifelong tools. Right. That apply at all different professions. Right. But then there are certain schools. Right. That it's just like, hey. You meet these requirements. You don't need to do anything more. You get your diploma. And then when you go to college, then you end up into a specialized field in college. And when you get your degree, 
you don't even follow your degree. I could say eight out of the 10 of my closest friends don't even use their degrees. Like they, they, they were like, I could say right now, five of the, my friends that were teachers, I'm the only one. <laughs> Everyone, I got three of them that are cops. I got another one that works at Target. He's probably listening to the podcast right now. And, and there's me and even me, I'm not doing it full time, but I think this plays later on in chapters five and six. We'll, yeah. we'll talk about that. Yeah, for sure. And what, what's interesting, I mean, I love, he says, um, to become financially secure, a person needs to mind their business. Uh, mind their own business. Your business revolves around your asset column, not your income column. He goes on to say, oftentimes people say things like, I need a raise. If only I had a promotion. I'm going back to school to get more training so I can get a better job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. More things, more of those kinds of excuses. If I need, they focus on income. And then he says this, in some circles, these are sensible ideas, but you're still not minding your business. These ideas all still focus on the income column and will only help a person become more financially secure if the additional money is used to purchase income generating assets. And I love that concept because I just think back to like, and it becomes more difficult the later you start in life because he kind of talks about you almost get into this rat race of like you have to pay your bills. The more as you get older and you gain more responsibilities and whether it's family and kids and, and you know, mortgage or rent and all of these things start to build up. But I think back when I was just out of high school, I was making pretty good money. I got into a, a really good job at a call center um, and then I worked my way up. And I was just spending money on things, right? I was doing what basically I was taught to do as a kid, which was, and I did a really good job at actually breaking away from what my parents taught me, which was buy a lot of things on on credit, right? And I, I bought everything in cash, but I just bought stuff, right? I bought a car and then I bought stuff to go inside the car and then I bought tinting for the car. And, you know, I just bought things, a different computer that I didn't need and a, a video game system and a bigger TV. And I bought stuff after stuff after stuff. And then I look back and after a few years, all of that stuff is like pointless now, right? But if I were to have spent all of that money at that time and income generating assets, if I would have said, you know what, I'm going to live as simply as I can now, I'm going to, I'm not going to quit my day job, but I'm going to use every bit of excess money that I can get to buy dividend paying stocks. And I'm going to use extra money to um, maybe, you know, invest in a, a, in a startup business. And I'm going to, and I just start putting my money into things. I'm going to save up for some real estate and, and try and rent out a piece of property. If I'd have just put all the money into that, I'd be reaping the benefits of that today, right? And so, but I wasn't taught that as a kid. I wasn't taught when you have money, buy assets, right? That wasn't no, nothing that was ever talked about. It, assets, things like maybe stocks were just things that rich people did. And you can only do if you were rich. It wasn't the thing you did in order to get rich. Well, I agree. And on a personal level, like I wish I read this book before, you know, my, my, my oldest son was born. Because here's what happened. So, you know, I already had been a teacher for about five years and I didn't know, you know, I, I knew about eBay and stuff because I had friends in college, but I didn't think about it as income generating. Right. Because we all know those of you that resell, like you buy stuff, you sell it. Hopefully with that money, you're buying more inventory and you're growing your inventory and you're selling more and you're building and you're building and you're building. The problem was I didn't have that understanding. So before my firstborn was born, I was like, okay, what do I do? How do I make money? How do I make sure that he's taken care of? And so I picked up all kinds of crazy jobs. I worked as a valet. I worked at in out Burger. I mean, I remember being in the drive through and having parents of my students going, oh, hey, why, why are you here? I'm like, well, you know, I need to make some extra income. So all I did is work. And all I did with that money, that money's all gone. That money wasn't reinvested in any kind of assets at all. Now, did it help with a lot? Sure, it did. You know, I was able to buy all the stuff I needed, you know, when, you know, all the expenses that come along with the new baby and so on. But once I did that, all that money was gone. I had no way of growing that money. So if you're a young family, right, whether it's you're a teacher, whether, you know, you're involved in any kind of profession and you feel that you're limited, this is why Mike and I started the podcast back two years ago. It's been two years now, two years right? Because there's different ways to level up your standard of living. And this is one of them, right? Not saying reselling is the end all, but reselling is pretty easy. Now, one thing I would kind of even push back and this, yeah. and, and it's, and I'm not pushing back with what you're saying, but okay. even with the idea of reselling now, the hard part, and again, this comes down to his definition of like a business, because uh, what he would consider like an asset business would be a business that he's able to start and kind of be hands off um, and just like put some money into, and then it generates money for him. Now, one thing I think the the reselling in some ways goes to the other thing he talks about, which is kind of starting your own business because you are working for the money. 
Now you take that money oh, and you're, you're 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 putting it in, hopefully buying more assets, better assets, and then. But the thing is, each of those assets is is like you're trading one time, right? So like you buy some for ten dollars, you sell for a hundred, you made ninety dollars profit. You had to do all of the work in the in the process of that, and then you could just stop, or you have to go out and buy something else. Whereas the ideal type of asset for to go into the asset like category, as it were, that that box would be something that you buy one time, and over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it's just constantly giving you money. You're constantly making money off of it. And I'll push back to that a little bit. So I am not, this is going to sound crazy. I am not a fan. Like I love Dave Ramsey, but I'm not a fan of waiting 30 years to be a millionaire. Like, I think that's too long. That's obnoxious. Like, I, I think it's great. I think it's a good idea, but I might not be around for 30 more years. I'm hoping, I'm hoping I'll be around for 50 more years. So to me, it's, yeah. I do believe you need to have money in mutual funds and you got to have all that. But if I could do things over, I would not have invested like I did earlier on. Like I would have instead d- done the, hey, start up businesses, increase the reselling, like done something where I could get a lot of capital. And then when I finally, this is why I'm opposed to buying a house <laughs> for your own personal reason, because I, I say flow that cash into something else that can get you more money. And then over time, when you have enough money to go around, and again, well, I'm speaking in theory because obviously we're not gurus here, okay? In theory, then it's like, hey, now I can, I can, like he talks about, he says, you know, and I forget what chapter, you can take greater risks, which will give you greater returns, right? Mutual funds is safe, but right, in order to really make a lot of money, you know, in a decent amount of time, like you have to invest a lot a lot of money. Right. And so for me, I, I like the reselling component as a stepping. stone. like, if, if you're just, if you're beginning, yeah, all your money should be going back into real estate. But now, I mean, for me, I, this is my third year now that I'm going into full-time reselling. Like all my money does not go back into my reselling, you know, especially now with the whole pandemic and the stock market, a lot of it has gone into stocks. A lot of it has been, you know, money being saved for a rainy day in case there's, you know, real estate opportunities. Like this isn't, reselling isn't the end all, but I will say I'd rather devote for a quicker return because, you know, I could wait 30 years, but what if I could make that cash now? That's just a thought of mine because I've, I've considered that too, but I'm like, Hey, I'm 40 and I'm not, you know, who cares if I have a million dollars when I'm 70? Right. I would rather have more than a million dollars when I'm 70 because I did a lot of things in my early 40s that could take me there. But we'll see. Who knows? Five yeah. years, I may be nowhere. And I think we're like, for instance, like the model of selling that you do, reselling. I think you get to a place though, and, and I'm trying to do this with where I'm at. I don't see myself necessarily growing to tons more inventory than I already have. I think I think between 500 to 1,000 items in my eBay store is good. Um, I think I could keep reinvesting more capital that I have from these cells and then I can go from a thousand items to 2000 items. But then the amount of working I'm doing to get there has to keep increasing. Like you get to a point where you either have to kind of hands off and change your model. And I think that would be fine. Like if I could hire employees and kind of do that, but that's not what I want to do. So what instead I'm doing is, okay, once I get the revenue coming in, I've worked hard enough to set up my store where I've got X amount of money coming in every month that it it pays the things that I wanted to pay and and it grows as much as my business as I want to grow. And as I'm getting, we've talked before about, you know, building that, that inventory uh, reservoir and having, you know, higher end items as opposed to just like $5 profit items. As you start to, your store gets to where you want it. Now the excess money that I have coming that comes in, then yeah, it goes to things like into stocks or into um, partial, you know, savings for a, or not necessarily savings, but like prep for like buying real estate or buying things that'll be bigger flips or things that are going to uh, make more money. So I think you get to a place where um, you can, you can only pour so much into the business without expanding the business to something else. And that might be what you want to do. Or you could say anything above what I'm making that I need to make in this business. And I've scaled up to the point where you get to a threshold, right? Where it's like, okay, either I, either I hire some employees or I go full time doing this or I keep doing it at this level and all the excess money I make now goes into the stock market or now goes into intellectual property, other things that I can do to create money sources that come in consistently, you know, and there's a lot of ways to do that, right? Like, um, I know you've talked before, like when you, when you did speaking to the students at the high school about like financial peace, um, the idea of 
How many people will write a book? And again, he does a really good job, and we'll get to that part later about um, you know marketing and selling and having lots of different skills. Mm -hmm. But one of the things you talked about is like you can write a book, put it on Amazon, and then it just becomes money that's trickling in consistently, yeah. right? Then you write another book and you write another book. That would be like intellectual property, right? So there's things you can do. You can create, you, you know, how many people out there make courses or um, do different things like that. So um, understanding that. And then I think too, just understanding the difference, the mindset. Um, and there's other books that kind of talk about this, like The Millionaire Next Door, I think is a good one that kind of explains Pretty like the, just the mindset difference between the real wealthy and people who want to look like the wealthy, right? Because a lot of times people try to emulate others, um, but it says this, um, as your cash flow grows, you can indulge in some luxuries. An important distinction is that the rich people buy luxuries last, while the poor and middle class tend to buy luxuries first. The poor and middle class often buy luxury items like big houses, diamonds, furs, jewelry, or boats because they want to look rich. They look rich, but in reality, they just get deeper into debt or on credit. Um, and what I like about that concept, uh, and, and he kind of talks, gives an example about his wife. They built their business up enough. They had enough real estate. And after like four years of having this, this real estate continuing to expand and having more and more money coming in, and they pay off the debts that it had. Then she's able to buy in cash a luxury car as opposed to hey, I've got some money coming in. I can afford this payment. I'm buying this luxury car. It's <laughs> a terrible place to be. Right. And so the idea though is so many people see like, look, that really, really rich person has a really nice car. So if I have a really nice car, it, it's a status thing. But what you don't understand is the most wealthy. And again, I think a lot of times people who are on like the poor or poor middle class look to like the upper middle class is what they see as wealthy. But there's that is not wealthy, right? Like there's a level beyond that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, I look at like, for instance, my brother-in-law is a good example. They both, my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law have really high income paying jobs. So they don't have very much an asset column at all, but they work really hard for the money that they get and they have a lot of money. So they're like definitely upper middle class, but they have lots and lots of luxury items. They can afford all those things. It doesn't hurt them at all. But instead of, if, if at some point, instead of getting the boat, instead of buying the the, the three like sports cars, instead of buying the, the desert toys, if they would have invested in, more stocks invested in some startup companies. If they'd have, if they'd invested that money, then they'd still probably have those things, but they'd also have an asset column that's twice as big, right? And that's the way you got to look at it. Instead of buying those things now, invest all that into assets, and then by the same time that you would have all those things, you have them, but you also have all those assets. So don't buy the luxury item first. Wait till your assets can and the income that those assets generate can buy you those luxury items. Well, it's kind of like where it doesn't hurt, right? It mm -hmm. shouldn't hurt you at all. I mean, I, I was going to say exactly what you're saying. You know, uh, he, he states, keep expenses low, reduce liabilities, and diligently build a base of solid assets, right? And it's, you know, go, we go back to Dave Ramsey, and we are going to read Totally Money Makeover for his next book. But he talks about, like, never buy a house that's going to cost you more than 25 a percent of your income. And that is so true. I, it's kind of, it relates to reselling because you know, the neighborhoods, right. That are house rich, right. Because you go to those garage sales and you're expecting like all kinds of scores. And it's like, and no offense. I mean, I have target stuff in my house and Walmart stuff, but it's like target and Walmart decor, right. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing of value. Like the house is really nice, but that's all they can afford. Right. And that house has become a liability. Right. And it's super interesting conversation because I had this conversation today with my son. My son's like, Dad, why aren't we moving? I'm like, son, our rent is at a great rate right now. Right. I have the flexibility right now to keep building without ever having to worry about finances right now. Like if I if I were to get what I wanted, I'd be doubling probably what I'm paying, right? Even maybe tripling what I'm paying, right? Because I've really got what I wanted. And then I would have to work even harder to cover those bills. Then I couldn't build the other assets I'm trying to build, right? I'm trying to build, you know, my reselling. I'm trying to build my portfolio. I'm trying to build the ability to maybe have, you know, it depends how the economy goes, acquire, right? Some property. So th that would just be foolish, yeah. maybe, right? Maybe we need to go in together on the, the property thing. Um <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my uh, my brother in law is a is a contractor, um, and and my wife is is a she's a certified interior designer. Nice, and uh, you know together we could throw Flip some capital house. together. We could do we could do like a duplex or something, you know, and that could be. I don't know if we'll ever get there on Pierre Russell podcast, but um, I mean that's a good way of kind of we've talked about it. we've talked about a punch of it one time. Yeah, who knows? I mean, maybe. <laughs> um, especially now, again, here's one of those things. 
He talks a lot coming up here pretty soon about like real estate and buying real estate. And I, I think even my knee jerk reaction is to go, yeah, but that was in like the time when you could just get crazy great property for just insanely low prices, right? Like at least in California, you can't do that. We've anymore. just been so jaded because we're in California. Yeah. That's but it. the reality is, and, and it's true, even in other places, you can get something for a lot less, but then the resale value on it is still going to be a lot less. Like the days of being able to buy something and 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 then within a couple of years, it's, it's gone so much in price. It just, those days aren't here, but things change. And there's always a way in different markets to find a different, maybe a different element or a different way of doing it. And one thing that, you know, Orlando and I have talked about, and, and again, this is just, you know, free opinion, take it, leave it. Who knows? It might be worthless. Uh, but <laughs> we just appreciate that you're listening. The idea is with, I mean, nobody knows how this whole COVID thing is going to shake out and the long-term ramifications. And we've been talking since day one of the podcast of positioning yourself in a, in a, a place where when things go bad, whether mm -hmm. in, in the economy or with stocks or whatever, you have the ability to swoop in and take advantage because the biggest money exchanges in, in the world happen during big financial crises, right? And so the people who are prepared for it, and maybe you miss this one, and then so you prepare for the next one because it's, it's cyclical. There's always going to be economic issues that come up. So- I have this feeling, this gut feeling, there's going to be a lot of real estate opening up commercial real estate as businesses are closing. And that is tragic, right? It's tragic that so many places are closing and they're losing. But then we also have to think, okay, we can either let those places go, let landlords not be able to rent out those places. And then that doesn't do anybody good. Or this could be an opportunity for people who've been kind of considering, should I start something? Is it risky? Sure, but if prices on on real estate go down, commercial real estate, maybe it's the time. So you and I'm not I'm not suggesting anybody do that, but what no. I'm saying is you've got to just think about situations change. What are what's the what's the climate where you're at? How can you take advantage? And and we've talked about that. I think with maybe it's four hour work week or no no is uh the ten x rule the unfair advantage yeah. right? And so you've got to find you got to be and that's why I think the the idea that he talks about a financial literacy is so important. The more you know different markets, the more you understand, the more you're willing to spend a little bit of time learning these things, then you can jump in on opportunities when they arise. No, agreed. I I, I think there's you know it's funny because I think a month and a half ago or two months ago we were trying to figure out what would be the best book right, and one time we were like yeah we shouldn't talk about any books about making money. Right. Because we were just like, things are bad. Right. But then as you know, we got more into this pandemic, we started recognizing that there were plenty of opportunities. Right. And, and it is, it is an interesting time right now. I, there was an article, I don't know if it was the New York times or the post that talks about how there's two kind of like two Americas right now. in in this time, right. Where there's, there's a lot of people that are profiting and there's a lot of people that are, just in a, and maybe some of you have come to the podcast to learn how to resell because right now you're trying to make trying to make it right and actually we've had a lot of people you know that DM us every day like hey guys so grateful that I started reselling when I caught the podcast a few months ago and actually now it's <laughs> it it's been a game changer for us and it's allowed us to do more than even pay the mortgage and so there are there is opportunities right there is opportunities and it's encouraging so. Another thing I wanted to share real quick, uh, and not, not from this chapter, but just on a practical side. So in the book, does your book have this where it has a study session after each chapter? Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't, you're not a reader, right? Which I, I still think you should read the book through and through. But if, you know, you just want to listen to the podcast, listen to the, our discussions of the chapter and then go to the study session place because they really, they do a great job. Like you pretty much, it's like the cliff notes of each yeah, chapter. It's like a one and a half page summary of the whole chapter. Yeah, it has all the great quotes and then it has the questions, right? So you technically can get away with reading the book without reading the book. So strongly encourage you there. All right, let's jump into the next one, huh? Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about taxes. Now, this one's interesting and I think it can be a little bit, <clears throat> um, maybe maybe can rub some people the wrong way. Um, and I think that's that's fair. I think everybody needs to think deeply about these things and where they stand on it. But the bottom line is right now, the place that the argument he makes is that initially the tax, the taxes kind of came in as, you know, tax the 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 wealthy in order to help supplement and, and support those who are in more need or, or the government because um, the, the wealthy can pay for it. And Repeal then, the 16th Amendment. And then We're starting a movement. <laughs> and then uh, over time, as government gets bigger and bigger and needs more and more money, and he even talks about one of my favorite parts about this chapter is uh, the 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 
government is incentivized to grow bigger and to spend all of the money possible, right? Like um, I've worked for different agencies that are-, Dude, are We've been in education. Yeah. What happens if you don't spend your yeah, money? If you don't spend the budget that you have next year, you don't get that budget, right? Like the, you get a reduced budget. And so there's in, you're incentivized to spend everything. Whereas business is the opposite. A business is incentivized to spend as little as possible and, and make as much as possible, right? So um, there's there's it's two different worlds. So what ends up happening- is as government grows, and this is the argument he presents here. So whatever you stand on this, but as government grows, it it almost he claims becomes greedy and needs needs more money, and so it can only get it by starting to tax the middle class and eventually the the, the poorer class. And so, what happens though is the wealthy have the financial literacy and the ability to find loopholes, to find ways to not pay taxes. So what ends up happening, and he talks about corporations being a big part of this and how to how to utilize a corporation, which is something anybody can do. Uh, but because the wealthy have financial literacy, instead of just working for the government, working and he basically says the average person spends or the average like middle class person spends like three to four months of their of, of their year working just paying taxes, right? So it's like that amount of time that you work just pays taxes. And so he says, but wealthy people have found, have the ability to um, understand the loopholes or to hire people to look for the loopholes and to eventually and essentially avoid paying taxes. And so his argument is make that work for you. Find ways to not pay the government and and keep more money in your pocket. And I, what I loved about it, and he doesn't even bring it up in this chapter. It's not until the end of the sixth chapter, but I could see a lot of people saying, but yeah, like, but that's not like loving to like the people who like, you know, need the money that taxes support. And he kind of explains that his rich dad, who was the one who avoided taxes every possible way he could, and his poor dad, who was highly educated, worked for the government, worked at a big institution, was a teacher. He said that his rich dad gave so much money away, gave money to churches, charities, to organizations to help people. Whereas his poor dad, who paid into taxes, never had enough money to actually help anybody could never give the money away. And so, you know, you can look at that and say like, there is a, a, an aspect where you actually have the money. If, if, if you're not paying the government, you can spend it on people and things and actually help to support. So you can still help. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a good idea. And I think a corporation is a good way to do it. And anybody who's doing a uh, reselling kind of already understands how they can make tax deductions. Well, this is why reselling. we always say go to a tax professional, like go to a CPA, go to somebody that knows their taxes. And I can tell you like, he Robert's right on this when he talks about the fact that when you work for an employer, your taxes will always be taken out. No matter what. There, there's no real way out of it, right? Your social security is gonna be taken out, you know, the the stuff that goes to the federal, you know, all these different things. But when you when you are self-employed, right? When you work for yourself, right, there are so many other possibilities of deductions and ways to incorporate your business, right? And, you know, he talks about like, you can take board meetings, uh, you know, in Hawaii, like whatever, whatever it takes. And so, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people get really upset, you know, with Jeff Bezos, right. And with Amazon and with these corporations that don't pay any taxes, but it's not that they're, you know, trying to, you know, be a, I don't know, like they're trying to be crooks about it or like there, there's some kind of thievery going on. They're working within the legal system that's been established. Right. And so, yeah. And that's the argument that Rob Kiyosaki makes is that those people are able to afford the team of lawyers and accountants that can get them every deduction, every expense. Right. And he talks about the idea that you spend the money before the government can take it. Mm. Right. And it's the same thing with reselling. Like I, you know, we talk about in December, buy your laptop, buy your, buy your tools for reselling, buy whatever you can. And why do, why do people on social media that do reselling say that it's because you're trying to spend that money before the government comes after that money. Yeah. Yeah. He has a great, like at the very end of the chapter, um, just an explanation of the order that it happens. He says business owners with corporations and the cool thing is, is let's say you're reselling. Obviously, you can you can run it as a business. You can actually get a corporate name. Um, he talks about a corporation isn't actually like a building or thing. Like it's just a legal document in a, a folder somewhere. That was interesting. Yeah, you can actually have a corporation. Like for instance, my corporation um, is is or or my business. I guess it's a corporation. Is is technically a media corporation, right? Like I, it's it's my last name and media, right? Like that's all it is. So with that, 
I can include so many things, right? Like anything that I do for reselling, anything that I do for my videography, anything that I do for um, for editing stuff for people, all the different ways that I have of making money and income, I lump it under there. And so lots of things I do can be expenses for that, right? Laptop, driving places, camera equipment, things that are like hobby-like for me. It's like, okay, well, if I make some videos and I put it up and I use it as promotion for my website, then it becomes a tax write-off. And this is something I would have liked to have done anyways, right? So you can find ways to make a corporation. And then, so even, even things like buying real estate or buying stocks, you can buy stocks personally and kind of treat it like a 401k, or you can kind of do what he does. And again, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not giving any advice on how you should open up a corporation. I'm suggesting do the research and find this stuff out, right? Like look into it, hire some people, watch some YouTube videos, but you can actually start a corporation and then invest instead of personally invest through the corporation and then you don't have to pay as much taxes. And then the, the order he gives here says, so ben, business owners of the corporations earn. So that's step one. Two, the second phase is they spend. And the third is they pay taxes. So they pay taxes on what they've, after they've spent things that they've earned, right? The opposite or the other end of the spectrum is employees who work for corporations earn. Then two is they pay taxes. And then three is they spend. So you only get to spend after you've already paid the taxes. You, the government's already taken a bunch of that money from you. Whereas if you do it through a corporation, you can spend the money first and then only pay taxes on what's left, right? So it just allows you to, the freedom. And again, it comes down to financial literacy. I'm not an expert in this. I'm learning this. I'm reading tons of books. I'm watching videos. Yeah, a little disclaimer scrolling through the <laughs> bottom. I'm joking. Um, so, <clears throat> but try and find ways to do that, right? Like, I, and again, it comes down to the wealthy. I mean, there's phrases like the wealthy get wealthier and the poor get poorer and things like that. And it's, there's an element of truth to that because it, as sad as it might be, it's not that the wealthy people, again, like you said, are always doing things. There may be instances where they're crooks or they do things that are immoral. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. I mean, we're all human. But a lot of times it comes down to, hey, I'm doing something that you could do too. I just have the knowledge to do it. Like you wouldn't, you would be upset if somebody for like, if you're doing reselling, if someone say, well, that's not fair. You're making that much money, you know, buying and selling those things because you know the market. You'd be like, well, yeah, I worked really hard to learn how to do this and which markets sell. And I failed a bunch of times and I had to find the right niche and I had to, I had to learn how to ship and I had to. So my success came from the knowledge that I built. And the same thing comes with money. Like it's more important what you know about it. And if you can learn ways to make more money in your pockets so that you can buy more assets and even turn those assets, mm -hmm. like he gives a great example, um, uh, like a perfect example of this. And, and this is something I heard from somebody again who was wealthy and they did this kind of thing. A lot of people don't know though. I mean, maybe you do if you're buying a house and you sell it and the, your real estate agent tells you, but if you own a house and you sell it and you buy a smaller house with it or, or you actually end up walking away with money because I did that at one point, I owned a home, I sold it, I used the money from that. Um, I did, wasn't in a position where I could have bought a new home or I didn't think I was and I paid off some debt and I paid off a bunch of stuff and it helped me get ahead. Uh, but I had to pay a ton of taxes, ton of capital gain taxes oh goodness, on everything yeah. that I made off that house. If you buy a bigger house, you don't pay any of those taxes. You're deferring it, right? So basically it's like, instead of paying the, those capital gain taxes, if you buy a, a real estate worth more money, you don't pay any of those taxes for the sale that you did. So even if you made money on the, the sale, you're not paying taxes because you've reinvested it. So it's just learning those simple things that you can do to take advantage of, or not take advantage of the situation, but but move within the, 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 the scope, the game that's been set. Right. And that's what you want to do. And the only way you can do that is by learning. It all comes down to what you know inside your head and and what you can learn and the people and the team that you have around you, as opposed to, you know, like he explains here, just kind of getting in that rat race of what the schooling system tells you, work really hard, get a good job. Then you'll have enough Be income. Be a good citizen, yeah. pay all your taxes. You have enough income coming in that you can pay your bills, right? But that just puts you like in this this hamster wheel of trying to, to you're just constantly trying to make enough money to pay the bills. And then you get more expenses or you want more expenses. You want a nicer car. And so you have to make more. So your only option is to keep increasing that income. But then problems happen. What happens if you lose your job? What happens if... So instead, if you can learn to maybe start a corporation, start building assets, start paying less tax, those things will help you actually have more money in your pocket and build real wealth. Going back to Richest Man in Babylon, right? That idea of real wealth, what you actually have as opposed to, you know, and he does a good job of talking in this chapter about a lot of people think things like, you know, I bought a new car, like they put that in asset category. I bought this, it's an asset category. You as a reseller know that something used is not worth the same as it is new 99% of the time, unless it's a specific type of collectible item. So buying something, the moment you drive it off the lot, the moment you start using it, the value has gone down. So it's not worth, well, you know, I spent 
my, my golf clubs, he used that example. My golf clubs are worth, you know, thousand dollars. I've got, that's how much, well, not if you sell them used, right? <laughs> They'll never go back. So no, all excellent points. And again, we're not here saying that you have to be shady about anything, but there are opportunities for you, whether you're part-time or you're full-time as a reseller or depending on the, if you're in real estate, I mean, I know so many people that are, you know, that do real estate and they just keep deferring and keep deferring. They keep growing their empire. It, it's, it's doable. I've seen it happen with my own eyes. I think we've said enough about taxes. I think we're good. All right. Hey, before we jump into the next chapter, if you haven't had a chance to follow us on social media, we are Pure Hustle Podcast on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. We are Pure Hustle Cast on Twitter. As always, you can leave us a voicemail at 619-738-1170. That's 619-738-1170. Or shoot us an email at purehustlepodcast at gmail.com. That's purehustlepodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. We also are on YouTube. And so you've been listening to the podcast, but you just want to, I don't know, check out our decor in our in our studio or the cool Patagonia hat that Mike wears. Uh, you can follow us on YouTube. Please subscribe and hit that bell button. We're almost at 4K. I don't know how far away we are 4K, but we're getting there. Yeah, subscribe. <laughs> Slowly but surely. But uh, hey, we appreciate the listen to the podcast. I mean, we've had our listenership keeps growing and we really appreciate that. And along with that, we appreciate all the reviews that are being written. We're almost at 300. I think we're like at three or four away on iTunes reviews. So if you don't mind just helping us out there and writing some nice reviews, that'd be great. We're just dropping the five stars. Always appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the donations that have come in. We've had some out of this world donations. Yeah, no, it means it means a lot to us. I mean, um, we talk a lot, obviously, right now about cash flow and making money and all of those things. Um, and and the podcast, just you know, just to be completely transparent, that that that's we spend a lot more time on this podcast than than revenue that comes <laughs> in, right? Like facts, that's not yeah. the that's not the purpose of the podcast. So when people do say, you know what, you you've provided value, we appreciate what you're doing, and, and you guys help out. Uh, whether it's buying a T-shirt, leaving a review, um, just giving us a kind comment, or or donating some money, those things are really what keep us going on this. And uh, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I've, I've we've learned so much from you guys and, and from oh, doing yeah. these like book reviews and stuff that we've definitely gotten our money's worth out of the podcast. Um, but you know, it it means a lot when you guys do those kinds of things for us because uh, you know, isn't that I, interesting? Like if if no one ever listens to the podcast, we still got a lot of our own podcast because <laughs> yeah. i mean even i would never have read this book if it was not for honestly i never would have read it if it was not for the podcast i mean maybe maybe but chances are very slim definitely would not have read some of the other books we've read if it wasn't for the podcast so so thank you all we appreciate all of you we are just grateful for the support all right are we ready for the next yeah. chapter chapter five the rich invent money all right so i'll, I'll let you you're on a roll I'm on a roll. You're on a roll. This is, this is, I, I feel like, uh, occasionally people say that, uh, that I don't talk enough in some episodes. So one. sometimes, sometimes the book reviews it, like I, I just, I go crazy, but like that's, I, I don't know. I get passionate about this. No, but stuff. I'm interested in your perspective. Cause I think this is one of the few books that were pretty much agreed on all points. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's a little bit of pushback here and there. It's funny because people sometimes say that there's tension. I'm like there's there's not there isn't tension. Yeah, I mean maybe a little bit. Like we, oh, I, there we is, disagree. Huh? We disagree with like some some stuff about like personal personal uh real estate and things like that. But um, but yeah, I mean I definitely we both make valid points, and I think again it's 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 always going to be situation dependent, right? Um, but okay, so uh, with the rich invent money, uh, he, he talks a lot about kind of understanding that um, you've got to find ways in different landscapes, different situations, different scenarios that you're able to make money and and we're moving into a a different culture right like real estate may be gone in a lot of ways like it's a hard i mean you could still make a ton of money in real estate but the days of being able to go buy drive to california you know and i hear my grandparents and it's like yeah and you were able to buy a hundred acres for for ten dollars you wild. know yeah i bought my house for you know twenty thousand yeah. and i'm like what yeah so those days might be gone and again i know money was you know people didn't make as much then but even still like counting inflation, all those things, like those were incredible prices. Um, but okay. So right off the bat, one of the quotes here I like is it says, once we leave school, most of us know that it is not so much a matter of college degrees or good grades that count in the real world, outside of academics, something more than just grades is required. I've heard it called many things, guts, uh, chutzpah, 
I said that wrong. Uh, audacity, bravado, cunning, daring, tenacity, and brilliance. This factor, whatever it is labeled, ultimately decides one's future much more than school grades do. Um, and I think this is just a good point to realize, like this idea of inventing money uh, and 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 finding basically problem solving and finding ways to make that asset column grow, where, whatever the situation is. We're moving out of that typical real estate as being the way to now there's, you've got mm -hmm. basically digital real estate, right? You've got intellectual property can be creative. I mean, people are making apps, people are making this, they're making, and a lot of times, yeah, somebody can come out and if you're hiring a starting position, you might care about what grade somebody got uh, at college or what college degree they got, but things have changed so much. And a lot of it comes down to what somebody is able to know. He talks about uh, a game that he created and it's a bolo, by the way. Yeah, the cash, cash flow, flow game sells for like hundred bucks. Um, and one of the the things I love so much about that section was he talks that um, some people when they play the game, like there's opportunity cards. I've never actually played the game, but there's opportunity, and you have to have the cash to like make the opportunity happen. And some people when they play the game, even watching them play the game, you can realize they don't have financial in intelligence. They don't have the <laughs> financial literacy. We should play this game. <laughs> they 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 don't know how to capitalize on the opportunities or how to that during the game, they can end up building liabilities. It's kind of like a game of life, but more like complex. Um, and, and it's a good way of teaching that, that, I mean, even think about the game of life, right? Like we were taught growing up, like go to college, the, the this. board game of life. Yeah. Or just like yeah, board game okay. of life. So, uh, you know, go to college. If you do the college path, uh, you get, end up making more money, which can help you in here. And you start thinking like that, but like things have changed. And again, I'm not saying don't go to college. I'm not saying go to college. It, it really depends on what career you're trying to go to and all of those things. But we're in a different landscape now. And the element, you've talked about this with like grit, right? The the, the idea of like, do you have what it takes to, to to figure it out, to go? Do you have the the willingness to say, I'm not just going to stick to the status quo um, and because you got to look, I mean, I think a great thing that I've often heard people say is um, do, and a lot of people have said this, but if you do what you always done, you'll get what you always have gotten. Right. And I see that with so many people, they, they've learned from their parents how to do money because schooling doesn't teach it. And honestly, I don't know. I mean, I'm for school reform in a lot of ways, but I don't even know if school would do a good job with that, right? Because there's so many different beliefs on how money works and how there's an incentive to get you to to, to follow certain paths. Um, but you should be learning these things at home. And a lot of times you don't, right? But you, you end up copying what your parents said. Did your parents buy things, you know, on credit all the time? Were they always in debt? Were they, how did they buy their house? Were they, I mean, I was talking about this with my wife the other day. Um, we've been lucky enough. And a part of it came down to the fact that I had bought that house. I sold it. I was able to pay off the car that we had a, a, a you know, remaining balance on. And ever since then, we've been able to buy cars pretty much in cash. We have one car that we've gotten since then and it's not paid in cash. Uh, but that set us up, right? And my parents, though, when I was growing up as a kid, they always just rolled over a car. They they drove it until it got a little bit old. And they usually still owed some money on it. But they get a, another used car. Usually they got used cars but they never had, they'd always roll the other car into it, right? So they would sell the other car. We'll give you $3,000 for this car. You owe 7,000. So we'll just add the other 4,000 on and it's only going to be an extra $60 a month. And it's like, oh, I can handle that. And so and, and you never end up owning anything. And, and a lot of times people never break out of that. They never learn. And so there's something else besides just schooling, besides, because you can get good grades and get caught up in that, caught up in the idea that you just have to work harder. And I love going back to that chapter three of mind your business, right? have your profession, have your day job, make money. There's nothing wrong with getting into a profession and working the nine to five or grinding it on real reselling or whatever it is that you're doing, but find ways to build assets. And you can only do that if you learn. But I, I think it's a, it's a perspective thing though. Like it, it's now, you know, if you're following along on the podcast and you're reading the book with us, now that you know this, now it's, now you're going to have to make the call. Right. You're going to have to understand, like, can you really invent money? Right. And I go back to when I first was in debt. I was over 36 K in debt and somebody had given me total money makeover. And I thought it was a scam. Right. But this is why we're going to read this book. I really was like, really, this guy's on the radio. Like, this guy's probably going to sell me a course or something. Right. And who would have thought that from I'm, this isn't even like talking about building assets. This is just talking about the money that I had from the money that I had. I actually felt like I invented money. Mm. Right. And how did I invent that money? Well, I invented that money because what I was able to do was actually look at my expenses and cut out expenses and look, 
money appeared. Right. And as I tightened that budget, more money appeared. And then I was able to start that debt snowball. And right now, actually, first I was able to establish that uh, emergency fund and then that debt snowball. And I, before you know it, somehow out of doing the same things that I was doing now, I did pick up a couple extra jobs, but I was able to pay that off in two years. You th- and at that time, like I can invent 36 K over two years to pay off debt. Like that seemed crazy. Right. So I really believe it's a perspective thing. Now, Rob Kiyosaki takes it to the next level. He's not talking about budgeting and saving. He's saying like, look for other opportunities to make money. And I, Mike is right. I mean, if there's ever a time, it, it's right now. Even during this pandemic, there have been so many people that have either gotten into reselling or they've they figured out other businesses. So I, was, I was watching on you know that very uh, awesome social media platform, TikTok. And uh, there was this guy who figured out that he can use a camera that like does like 3D models of spaces. And he was able to get real estate uh, individuals to pay him like, I don't know, it was like 150 to 200 bucks to go to these homes. So people that didn't want, you know, because of COVID to go out there that they could actually see a 3D view of these houses. And so there you go. He invented money, right? He came up with that unfair advantage. He was willing to go out there and he just paid like, you know, whether it was real or not, I don't know. But that's the example that it showed in that 15 second TikTok. And I thought that's pretty amazing, right? And there's plenty of things that people right now during this pandemic have thought of that I would have never have thought about, but I think it was a perspective going, Hey, the only way I'm going to make more money is by just working more hours. Yeah. And I think he talks here specifically with like the inventing money uh, and he gives real estate as an example. And he, he, I would say of a lot of the authors we've read, he's been the most candid as far as saying like the examples I'm giving you, I'm not suggesting you do them, right? Like, like this worked for me, um, because of the situations that I was in, you might have to figure out something else that works for you. But he uses these examples. And one of them he explains is like buying houses or buying real estate. And he didn't have all the money up front, like when he was first yeah, starting talking out. talking about wholesale. Yeah. Um, well, uh, part of what he was doing was, was he was like, he, would, he knew he had a property that was inexpensive, right? He was able to get it extremely low, but he didn't have the money, but he needed the down payment, right? Like he, he financed the rest, but he needed the down payment. He didn't have the down payment. So he borrows the down payment from a friend. Hey, can I borrow, you know, 2,500 bucks? I'll give you, you know, $200. I'll give it to you within the next 60 days, right? So he gets a loan from his friend. He gets the down payment with just the property and the down payment that he's paid on it. He then sells it, makes a bunch of money off of it and pays his friend back the 200 bucks. So basically for the cost of $200, which came from well, the money he, connects, he made. He connects a buyer. Yeah, he connects the buyer. He's, like he get he connects the buyer. So he has, that's what, that's what he people brokers call, the deal. Yeah, that's what house wholesaling is called. Yeah. That's what it is now. I did have, we talked about this, I think last time we talked about this book and then we had a few of, a few of our listeners go, Orlando, we tried that and we made money, but it was a hustle. Like mm. it was tough and we get out of the game. So it all depends where you're at. Now, the, you know, and certain states have laws that, do not support it. And you can't really do it that way anymore. But yeah, I'm sure when Robert Kiyosaki was doing it, it was pretty easy to do. Yeah. And, and again, he used it as an example. Like, for instance, if you're starting out in reselling, you know, market, right? I really know, you know, vintage music equipment. I don't have $5,000 to buy this guitar, but I know for a fact, if I can get this guitar for $5,000, I could sell it for $10,000 in like 30 days or like in, in 24 hours, right? Like a lot of people, you can find those deals. And if you don't have the capital, if you don't, but you can maybe invent money, go to a friend and say, look, can I borrow the $5,000? And, and again, this, he talks in the next chapter when we, we'll get to it about the idea of marketing and selling and, and, and kind of getting out of your comfort zone to do those things, but to say, hey, can I borrow the $5,000? I'll pay you back in, in 30 days and I'll give you a hundred bucks, right? Like you're getting a better loan than you can get at a, at a bank. You buy it, you sell it. You give the hundred dollars to the person plus the five hundred five thousand that you borrowed or whatever that number is. Now you've got capital. Now you've got four thousand nine hundred dollars cash that you can use for more things, right? You invented money. You literally use zero of your own. And again, you're taking on risk. You have to have have people, whether it's a bank or friends or somebody willing to invest. But if you know the industry, you can do that. And it comes down to what he says here: the single most powerful asset we all have is our mind. A little bit later, he says, "This is why I invest in my financial intelligences, developing the most powerful asset I have." I want to be with people moving boldly forward. I don't want to be with those left behind, right? So it kind of goes with surrounding yourself. And my wife for a long time, um, she nannied for a very 
like extremely wealthy couple. Um, and the cool thing was, is through that, she got like a, a job working with them and then got another job working at a corporation that they had. And I was able to go hang out with them. And just being around really wealthy people and listening to the things they were talking about, listening to the things they were investing in, listening, you gain a lot, right? But you can only like surround yourself with the most successful people you can and you'll find yourself moving with them and not getting stuck. Because you can look and you can say, hey, a lot of my friends are kind of stuck in this month to month. They're trying to pay their bills. Um, I could be like that or I can try and find a way to break out of that. And the only way you can do that is by developing your mind, which goes back to what you said about reading that the, the total money makeover. If you weren't taught those things at home, you can invest in your intelligence and your financial literacy just by reading books, just by learning from people who understand these things. And that totally changes everything. Go, he goes on to say, so why bother developing your financial intelligence? Again, only you can answer that. I know why I continue to learn and develop. I do it because I know there are changes coming. I'd rather welcome change than cling to the past. I know there will be market booms and market crashes. So reselling, I think, is a great way to prep us for that. And you know if you're a reseller that that maybe a certain type of shoe is hot now. Maybe comics are hot. Maybe basketball cards are hot. Whatever's hot isn't necessarily going to be hot in five years. And you're constantly, you got to be willing to embrace change. And right now our country is going through, the world is going through technological changes. And a lot of times it causes fear. I remember even with social media, like in the very beginning, I was like, man, I don't want to jump on that. I see a lot of harm that it causes, but you can embrace change and say, how can I capitalize on this? Because a lot of people are going to do it. And you can either be one of those people to find ways to invent money, or you can kind of get stuck in the past. Yeah. And I, I will say, out of all the chapters, this was the toughest chapter for me because it's really hard if you're in a place that you've only understood that the only way to make more money is by just working more. Because that, that's what I've always done. And, and now, you know, yeah, <laughs> you guys watch this on Instagram. I do work a lot, right? But I work when I want and I, I have figured out other ways to make money. And we, I don't share all of it on the podcast, right? Because we're mainly a reselling podcast. But there, there are so many other possibilities out there. And so it's a tough one. I mean, I really do believe when Robert Kiyosaki says, do something that you enjoy. And Mike and I'll go back and forth on this one, maybe. But I will say when it comes to inventing money, I do think it has to be that. Because I, I think you will, you will burn out quick if, it, if you're trying to come up with ideas, but it's something you really don't care about, it's going to be hard. But if it's something you're passionate about and you can pivot and you can make it your own and you can make money, I think there's way more potential in that than going, hey, I saw some guy doing household selling, so I'm going to get into it. Because yeah. you may not care about it and you'll be super miserable and then you're going to say, I'm done with this. So you definitely have to, I think there has to be some kind of buy-in if you're going to go into inventing money. Yeah, no, absolutely true. But part of it, like, so let's say you're passionate about, and that'll go into the next chapter. He talks a lot about a lot of people are one skill away from actually becoming very wealthy, right? Like they're very specialized mm -hmm. in one thing. They know one thing really well. And if they just learned, maybe it's marketing or if they just learned sales or if they just learned one other aspect, they'd be able to just totally increase the amount of money that they make. And a lot of people get caught into one thing. So I think sometimes the thing you might be passionate about, like I remember telling my brother this, my brother wasn't like, he didn't have a job at the time and he was like struggling to make money. And he played a lot of pool, like just in the house, hanging out. And I'm like, bro, the cool thing about like life is if you were to spend 40 hours a week doing something, you can make a living, like something you love to do. But you can't just, like I say, it's playing pool. You really love playing pool. You can't just play pool in the house alone or go to bars and play pool and, and make a living doing that. You got to say, I love doing this thing. Now I might need to learn a skill that's not necessarily something I'm excited about. Marketing, selling, making videos on how to do this, or, or going and teaching some classes, teaching kids how to play pool that don't know how to play pool, right? I'm, that might not be something I'm passionate about, but if I want to make money doing this thing that I love, I might have to learn another skill, right? And I think that's really important. And one of the things he says here is- Are we at well, chapter six already? Almost, but okay. <laughs> it says- um, he's talking about kind of the, the he gives some uh, rules, like five rules or five like things. And in each chapter, he ends with like a um, some a list of words yep. that are kind of investment, you know, it's minded really to help you learn. So you can kind of learn slowly as you go. But he says this. Um, 
but always remember to have fun. When you learn the rules and the vocabulary of investing and begin to build your asset column, I think you'll find that it's as fun a game as you've ever played. Sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. I like the way you phrase that, but have fun. Most people never win because they're afraid of losing. And so- That is very true. It's a game, you, like you can almost think of it as a game, right? Like I, I for a long time, I'm actually, I feel like, and again, nothing against people who play video games. Like I do certain things for, inter- like I hike, right? Like that's a, could be considered a waste of time. I think it's good for my health and stuff. I'm not making money while I do it. Um, but I've broken out of playing video games because I'm, I'm get, I have such an addictive personality that I find myself playing like a game like World of Warcraft where I'm just spending hours and hours making, I think this is like a big bang quote where basically making invisible money so that I can buy invisible things or imaginary money so I can buy imaginary things in an imaginary world, right? Or I could put that same amount of time and energy and learn how to do some Forex trading or learn stocks or or learn uh, internet marketing. Or do a Twitch of World of Warcraft. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. there's so instead of just doing things that that aren't making me money, I can I can play the game of making money, and you can make it fun. And once you learn the 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 kind of the rules and the phrases, he, the five that he gives is. Um, Find an opportunity that everyone else missed, right? And this comes to like constantly thinking, what are problems? What are things you can do? Is it something in real estate, stocks? Is it a niche people aren't in, right? Like, are you? did you find a market in reselling that other people haven't discovered yet? That's the first thing. Then raise money, right? Like part of it is just learning to, to be willing to go and ask for money to, to be, especially when you're talking about big businesses, you might have to say like, hey, I have this opportunity that just came up. Like, uh, I'll, I'll throw her out there. I, I've watched several videos of eBay Princess, and one of the things that she's said is there's times where she sees a big deal, right? She's got a good, she's got a good relationship with her bank, and she sees like, hey, here's the thing that I can buy for thirty thousand dollars, and I know I'm going to be able to triple my money in the next sixty days on this thing. I don't have just that much capital laying around. I go to the bank, I take out the loan, and 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 that's that's scary for a lot of people. But if it's, you know, yeah. if you know your market, if you know what you're doing, you can take those risks and you can do those things. Um, and raising money, knowing how to do that and not get, not actually end up on the wrong end of that. You can, you can raise money poorly and end up owing money. Uh, and then the third one was organize smart people. And I think this is like crucial is having a team of people. And one of the things he says that I, I like is um, intelligent people are those who work with or hire a person who's more intelligent than they are. When you need advice, make sure you choose your advisor wisely. And and that is, I think, even just naturally, people tend to like to be the smartest person in a room or like to be the, the coolest, the funniest. But if you actually think the opposite, if you think, you know what, I want to make sure, even if I'm the one that's making the money on the deal, if I want to be the, the real estate guru or whatever it is, I'm going to bring in some people who are way smarter than me. Maybe somebody knows accounting or law, right? Like I'm not a lawyer but I'm going to bring in the smartest person that I know who knows law to help me with this thing so that I can make as much money as I can. Swallow your pride and find the smartest people. And the sad thing is a lot of times in companies, the smartest people aren't the ones making the most money, but they're helping the people who are smart enough to hire the smartest people make the money, mm-hmm. right? So that I think is true intelligence. Like he says, intelligent people are those who work for or hire a person who is more intelligent than they are. So don't feel like you have to be the smartest person. I mean, when I was doing... Uh, teaching video to my students at my, at my last school, um, there were a couple of students who I saw quickly gaining skills faster in areas than I had. And I never once thought like, oh man, I'm their teacher. I need to be better at them at, at this element of this program that we're using. I would encourage, man, keep learning, learn everything you can about that and, and just keep doing that and, and watch as many YouTube videos. And then when we come together as a group and we have a project, you can tell us how we can use that in this next video, right? And I let the students be smarter than me in things. And that is the best place that you can be because then as a team and me, the one ultimately responsible for the video that goes out to production, um, it's better than to say like, no, no, no. Like if I don't know it, you're not going to do it. Right. Like that's a foolish place to be. Oh, I agree. I I mean, I a hundred percent agree. And I can go on story after story, but in in, in the world of education, I always found that the... (laughs) At the administrative level, the administrators that were unwilling to let their best run the show ended up doing poorly every single time because it's it's a thing of it's it's a thing of pride, yep. right? You just gotta we gotta be in a place of humility. All right, I like this next chapter. Uh, I think it was probably the best chapter that we read. It's work to learn, don't work for money. Chapter yes, six. <laughs> but I liked it because well, because I could I have so many examples to give, but. I like I like the story. You know, he's being he's being interviewed by by a reporter, and she's a great writer, right? She has a English lit, I think, uh, degree, and she writes some great articles, but she's not getting noticed. 
and he tells her you should go into a sales training program, which even myself before doing this whole reselling thing, I didn't think there was a much to sales. Mm -hmm. I was ignorant. And it's funny because there was a guy, there's a parent I had who would school me all the time. He would get me to agree to stuff for his kids that I had like principled, like I'm not going to bend to this. And he'd be like, he he called me up. He's like, Orlando. So is it going to be A or B? Which I, I don't know what selling tactic it is, but it's basically like you don't give the other person an option. They have to choose one of the two. And I'm like, I guess it's going to be B, Robert. And I remember my, <laughs> I talked to another guy that was in sales. He's like, Orlando, you just got schooled and you didn't even know it. And it my arrogance, I thought that my, you know, my college degree and all that, da da da, right? could outsmart this guy, but this guy, you know, now I concede like this guy knew far better how to play that game than I did. Right. And he worked me and I'm okay with that because that lesson is with me till this day. And when I'm reading this and how this, this reporter got upset. Right. And he talks about, you know, basic example, he goes, he told her, he told, uh, he told her, he said, so you don't want to be in the sales program. Okay, take a look at my book. And it was one of his early books. And he points to his book and he says, what does that book say? And she says, well, it says best-selling author. And he's like, exactly. Best-selling author. Yeah, not best, best author, right? Best-selling. And it's so, so true. How many times have you or Mike or I encountered someone who was, maybe they weren't even good at what they did, right? Maybe they were like moderately or maybe maybe they were just a novice, but okay, we're in the reselling world. How many resellers out there aren't great resellers, but they're good, good at selling you their mastermind or their course or how many? How many YouTubers, right? Think about that, right? That's a different skill set, right? I do believe, I mean, res- reselling as we know it is not the same as sales. Now, if we were trying to broker deals and so on, that's different, right? But selling on eBay and Amazon that you don't, you don't have to communicate with people. You literally could be up in the mountains, talk to no one. As long as you got your inventory coming in, you can flip stuff all day long. But that's to, to what Robert Kiyosaki is saying is like, if you're in a place where you only have one skill set, you need to have other skill sets. Yeah. And he specifically he's talking about go sales. It's basically the type of selling, like, a lot of the the books that we read are people who really that's just that's what they teach right and yeah. that's what they do is they teach salesmen how to sell and the, the it's different in the sense that uh, that kind of sales is the person who's willing to pick up a phone call and call 500 people a day and say hey i've got this program i got nope okay and they hang up and they call the next person and then they're willing to call people over and over they go door to door they ask people they show people stuff and it takes a lot to be willing to lose multiple times to be willing to be told no to to get over the fear he talks a lot about that. In fact, one of the strategies he suggested at the very end, which is like, you know what? I've never thought of it like that. And I still wouldn't do it because I wouldn't want to bug my friends. But he says, even joining an MLM, you right? You can bug me. Uh, one of those multi- uh, Oh, no, no, the, don't do that. Yeah, no. Yeah. So like like the the basically a, <laughs> see what a, a he's pyramid saying. scam. He's like, do one of those. He goes, because a lot of times they have really good training programs that teach you how to sell and get over the fear of selling and then use that skill because one of the, the key concept of this entire chapter is don't work in order to earn money. Work to learn skills because if you work at something and you learn a skill and, and the, the key concept is know a lot about a lot, right? No, or not even a lot, but know enough about a lot of things that you can synergize those things into into a, a sk- or a, whatever it is to make you money, right? If you know a little bit of accounting and a little bit of law and a little bit of business and a little bit about taxes and a little bit about sales and you're a really good writer, boom, you've got yourself some best-selling books or the ability to market and get yourself out there. Whereas opposed to if you're just a really good writer, but you don't have those skills. And sometimes those skills are just, like you said, organizing smart enough people around you to help you. Um, but even going back to like, you know, doing what we've done, like kind of the the, the catalyst that got us going with with the podcast and doing things on Instagram and those types of things was reading crushing it by Gary V. Right. And the whole idea about that is it's really self-marketing really. That's that aspect of sales is you got to put yourself out there over and over. I didn't know. I mean, I knew a little bit, but I didn't know like to be real with you guys. 
I was on Instagram in like 2011 or 2012 when I worked at the school and it was like we did a senior trip and we used it for like two days. It had been, I don't know, five, six years since I've been on social media at all. I had to think about that, right? But it was a skill that we had to learn, right? Or no one would be listening to us right now. Yeah, exactly. And that's a crazy thing is, is and, and that goes back to what he said, you know, and I paraphrased it earlier, but a lot of people are only one skill away from being very successful. Like I said, my brother really likes playing pool. He's He, he might be an expert pool player. He might be like, maybe not the passion to go professional or whatever, or chess. That's a good example. Like I was really big into chess and a lot of the grandmasters, some of the best players didn't make any money at all, barely any money in tournaments and things. And some players who were really good made a ton of money because they coached, they had lessons, they sold workshops, they made, they wrote books. And so it wasn't just that they were really good at chess. They found another skill. They found out how to market what they were doing. And so a lot of times that's what you got to figure out how to do. Uh, he says in school and in the workplace, the popular opinion is well, the idea. I about to read uh-huh. that. It, I'm right here. Like exactly. You do right it. Here. You read it. Uh, sure. All right. Maybe now the listeners are like, oh, great. We have to hear Orlando. All right. If there's ever a point, listen, if, before I read this, if you're in education, you have to own this. I, I hundred, listen, I'm going to be real with a lot of people here. Every job you are dispensable. Every job. Be aware of that. And, and Mike's going to think, is this coming from Jade or Orlando? It's not coming from Jade or Orlando. I'm just, in my experience from a lot of people, you get to a place somewhere and you're like, I have so many skills. I bring so much to the workplace. And one day you may be called into an office and maybe your last day and you never saw it coming. So what we're going to share here today applies in that sense. And it also applies in another sense that like, Hey, if you want to level up your standard of living, you, this philosophy to me is a non-negotiable and I'll share that in a little bit. Why? Okay. So let me read it now. Sorry. I, I just had to get into that because we get so stuck in thinking that we're going to be working somewhere forever. Chances are, you got a 50 50 shot of that never happening. Mm-hmm. All right. It says in school and in the workplace, the popular opinion is the idea of specialization. That is, in order to make more money or get promoted, you need to specialize. That is why medical doctors immediately begin to seek a specialty such as orthopedics or pediatrics. The same is true for accountants, architects, lawyers, pilots, and others. My educated dad believed in the same dogma. That is why he was thrilled when he eventually achieved a doctorate. He often admitted that schools reward people who study more and more about less and less. And so I look and then do, should I read the rich dad part? Sure. Am I reading too much of the book? Okay. Rich dad. You just want to read the whole thing. This is now the audible, uh, rich dad, poor dad. I know. Right. Sorry, Robert Kiyosaki. Rich dad encouraged me to do exactly the opposite. You want to know a little bit about a lot was the suggestion. That is why for years I worked in different areas of companies and he goes on about, you know, he worked at Xerox and in the Marine Corps, he decided to move out to be a, a helicopter pilot and so on. But I look at this and one of the best bosses I had, my last boss, he came from the business world. He did sales for like 10 years. He had zero educational experience. Zero. Now, I worked at a private school and so private schools, they don't have this, all this credentialing stuff like some do, but credentials only matter so, so much. I mean, you do have to have a degree, but... If you got the skills and you can, you can do things well, like some of the best teachers I've ever hired had zero educational experience. Except they now, they, I had yeah, I know. You, you, experience and you, I was a pretty good teacher. You, you were, no, you were awesome. You're, you're, you're top one. Okay. So, but they were, they were, they came from the business world. They came from sales and you know why they were so good. They could sell what they were teaching. They could get students to walk out and go, I can't wait to hear more tomorrow or, you know what? I actually had kids that go like, wow, that homework sounds really good. Like th- that's because they could sell it. Right. And I've had some of the most erudite, most intelligent teachers be the worst I had ever seen. Guys that like, if it was a second story window, I would open that window and I, I'd be out. Like I'd be done because they were, I'm glad it was you that would be out. I was worried that they were going to go out. <laughs> no, while I'm observing, while I'm observing. They were brilliant, but man, their skill set at, at selling and at marketing was just terrible. And the reason I share all this is because this boss I had came over from the business world. And I, asked, I said, hey, can you mentor me? Can you teach me? Because I, you know, it was my fifth year as an administrator. It was, my, it was my last year. No, actually, it was my fourth year. 
It was my second to last year. <laughs> and uh, there's a whole, there, that's a whole other story about why, you know, I chose to go. But what ended up happening is I asked him, I said, hey, I want, I want to learn how to be a better administrator. But he gave me all these business books. I told him, I said, I expected you to give me like how to make better lesson plans or, or how to cater to teachers or, or something. Instead, he gave me all these sales books. And to this day, that stuck out to me. And then I asked him, I said, hey, listen, I'm in this place and I don't know what to do next in my educational career. Now, I do remember a decade ago, I was either going to have my like school offered a loan program to pay for your credentialing. I think you did the same thing. And you could get your credentialing or you can get your master's. And if I did my, my credentialing, it would have specialized me even more, right? I, I only would have been good to the state of California in a, in a certain field. But I'm like, no, like, why would I do that? And I instead got my master's in history. And that made me way more marketable internationally, right? And I, I had opportunities to teach students internationally. They didn't care if I had a credential. I had opportunities to teach in different states. Now I teach. And guess what? I teach a homeschool co-op group. And I don't need a credential, right? I, my master's degree gives enough of a, I don't know, street cred or teacher cred or educational cred for people to go like, this guy knows what he's doing, right? And also my years of experience. But the reason I say this is because all those books that I read, I'll never forget going to conferences. And uh, I've shared the story with you so many times, Mike, but I remember my, so in education, education is very tribal. So when you go with your, with your school to like a conference, most teachers just hang out with, with themselves and then network when you have to, right? This guy came from the business world. And I saw, I remember going to some conferences with him and he goes, Orlando, I don't want to see you at all today. Don't come and talk to me. I'm like, what? Dude, like, no, like, I didn't say dude, I said, sir, what? Are you serious? He's like, no, I don't even want you eating with me. You go and you network and you network and you network. And we, and we can catch up at the end of the day. And I'm like, why? 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 Why would you tell me that? Like, you know, at the end of the week, he goes, Orlando, in the business world, like, why would you, why would you hang out with your own business? If you're trying to make more money and you're trying to make more connections, you're going to network with other people. You're going to market. And so I, I'm reading all this and I'm going, he's so right. Like, these are things that I already knew beforehand, but Robert Kiyosaki put it into words. Yeah. And if you think about like how you can do it, you know, intentionally. And I think I heard somebody say one time is actually at a teaching conference, but he talked about different generations, how some generations kind of went into college a certain way. And the next generation, like the millennial generation kind of had a pick and choose. They went to college and they picked the, the courses they wanted. It was kind of create their own degree. Whereas the Gen Z model is almost hacking college. And instead of going to college, they're going to a lot of different uh, corporations and they're working um, you know, as interns, you know, if you're, if you're interested in, in marketing, they go to a company and they work as an intern for marketing, they work their way up a little bit. And then they get a couple of courses in marketing through that, that organization. And then three years later, they go to another organization, they work in another department and they get a couple more degrees, right. Or a couple more classes or courses they take. And by the time that, you know, they've gone through 10, 15 years of their career, they basically have all of these credits, all of this experience, and they've kind of hacked college. They've, they've developed their own uh, basically education they've learned. And that kind of goes with what he says here. He says, the net result is that most workers never get ahead. They do what they've been taught to do, get a secure job. Most workers focus on working for pay and the benefits that reward them in the short term, but are often disastrous in the long term. Here's where it gets interesting. Instead, I recommend to young people to seek work for what they will learn more than what they will earn. And this is so good. And I've been lucky because I didn't do this intentionally. But as I look back and reflect on my life up to this point, I got a job right out of high school and I've done a lot of things. I've done security. I was a bouncer at, a, at some bars. I'm waiting for that one that I haven't heard yet. Um, I, I've, <clears throat> I've, I've flipped signs. I actually, you know, I've done, I've, I've heard all these. I've done, I've done some, uh, some other crazy things, but I've done so many things that, that, that taught me things, but where I really see like, okay, I can see like a straight line of my growth and the skill sets that I have now. I worked for DirecTV in their call center and I learned two things there. I slowly worked up to a management position and I learned at a really young age how to start managing people. Took a bunch of courses. They made me go to a bunch of conferences. I had to read lots of books, how to deal. I mean, I was a young guy and I was dealing with people who were much older than me. And so I'm learning, okay, how do I, how do I deal with, how do I 
develop trust amongst people? How do I communicate with my team? How do I make sure I have the best team? I was learning those skills. Another skill that I learned there that was really, really important was I learned how to use Excel. Like, crazy good. Oh, that, I, that's I, a good skill. I, I, I had to do report after report. Every day I'm doing reports. How many calls coming in? How many calls going out? What's our rates on jobs being closed? All of these things. And so, okay, I leave that job. But that the skills that I have in Excel and the skills that I have, you know, for managing people, people go with me. Then I go to college and I learn, you know, I've learned a lot about technology. I was really into technology on my own. So I learned technology stuff and I go to school and I get a degree to teach high school. And then I also get my master's degree in technology. And so I'm learning about technology. Then I move from that. And in that schooling, opportunities open up. I meet somebody who starts teaching me about video. I learn how to do video. My wife and I were doing like a, a YouTube channel for a while. I'm, so I'm learning how to do video. I'm learning how to that. edit. I moved into uh, making uh, videos for the school and teaching courses. So literally that job allowed me to learn video, which was a key component for doing the podcast that we have right now on audio, right? So if I wouldn't have learned those things, then I, we wouldn't be able to do this now. Then I, the things like, um, the, the spreadsheets and all that stuff are helping me with reselling. Now I'm learning reselling, right? Like all of these skills now have come and I can make money in so many different ways. And I'm, I'm just now starting to realize how little skills that I've learned from all of these different employers that I've had throughout the years that have taught me different things. I now I'm developing my intellectual, uh, asset as it were, like my ability to capitalize on the knowledge that I have. Now, if I'd have just right out of school, went into teaching and I only taught English, and I never taught technology. I never got a degree in technology. I never learned Excel. I never learned how to manage people. I'd be a teacher and that's it. I wouldn't be able to do anything else. I wouldn't know how to manage people because I mean, you know, you, you have to manage students. There's classroom management, but adults are a little bit different than students. And a team is very different than being the authority figure in a room. Right. And so all of those things have shaped me into who I am. And I think this is such great advice. If I could, I'm just thinking about like my son, if I can encourage my son, okay, what's better, but you're not going to necessarily need to be. And he even makes a comment here. Like if you're going to go broke, go broke by 30, right? Like you just, there's time to recover by then. But I would rather my son as weird as this sounds work for three or four years for, for companies and maybe start to work his way up. But instead of necessarily get locked in that company, learn some really good skills, move on to another company. And by the time he's 30, he's got all of these skills that he can capitalize on and do something with them and not necessarily be like, yeah, I'm really, really, really specialized at this one thing. He even uses the quote in here that I've heard over and over when it comes to education, like getting a doctorate's degree. A, a, a person who's an expert knows more and more about less and less. That's the concept of an expert. Yeah, you like know, in history, it's... it's yeah. yeah anyway, I, I thought about that when I was... I had two choices for my master's. Master choice number one was to get it in technology, education technology, which is like, this is the future. I need to do this. The other one was in English and I would have to specialize in a specific thing. And I think mine that I could would have been like 16th century Gothic uh, French literature. Yeah, in right? history, it's like you're learning the life of fishermen on a random boat somewhere right? in, in a certain like five-year period. And if you get your doctorates, it gets yeah. even more specialized. It's like not just like a whole century and a type of literature, but it's like three different authors. And so you become the expert on those. I could write books about those authors. I could write, but that's my skill set, right? I'm locked mm -hmm. into that and that's all I can do. And maybe that does allow you to make more money in that field. But, and he goes into talking about like the importance of unions for people who are specialized because you almost need the protection because you don't have any skills that's really profitable if you were to lose that job, right? If you're stuck and he even talks about like, you know, an airline pilot, because he was a pilot for a while and he used that skill to learn like international trade, how trading routes work and things like that. That's why he took that job and to learn how to manage people because he was in the military. So you can, you can get really stuck into one job, but if you lose that job, and, and my dad is a perfect example of this. My dad went into um, printing and again, it's kind of like a factory job. And he spent over 20 years, I think 25 years in the printing industry. Newspapers start to go down, right? He loses his job. He's very specialized in that. Now all he can hope for is like another job at a factory, which because he doesn't know that equipment and that stuff and that he can only come in as a starting base level employee, right? And so he specialized so much. And again, there's nothing wrong. Like if you want to get into factory work, there's so much money there, right? I'm not saying don't do that, but going back to the chapter of mind your business, right? Don't be afraid to have your day job, but then find ways to, if you also would have been learning investing and if you also would have been learning, hey, this new thing, the internet's coming out. I'm going to start learning how to do web pages and stuff. Maybe there's money here. Then when something goes wrong and newspapers basically go out of business, you still have another, another whole arsenal of tools that you can pull from.
Agreed, agreed. And and it I know this episode sounds like we're very education. Uh, hey, did I just mispronounce education as an educator? Educational. Yeah. Very education focused. And obviously cuz it comes from two educators. But you can you can put anything in there, right? You could put garage mechanic, you could put tax accountant, whatever profession. The key thing is is that make sure you increase your skill sets because when you increase your skill sets, it also allows you to have a different perspective. It allows you to find ways, right? To invent money. It allows you ways to market and sell yourself. So key, so important. And I'm glad, I'm thankful for Robert Kiyosaki putting this in writing because even as resellers, we can get stuck in like, hey, I only want to focus on reselling. Now, as a podcast, that's what we're about. But it doesn't mean that maybe one day Pierce Podcast becomes something different. Right. And Mike and I have had discussions about that. We don't know where that road's going to lead us, but you have to be able to make those obvious choices to go, hey, I'm going to be intentional about my education so I can have those abilities in the future. And with that being said, we got to cut this podcast short. Make sure to be real, be relevant, and be reselling. Late. Mm-hmm.